I take refuge from the evil who tempts us away from the truth. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In the name of Allah, the tenderly compassionate, the infinitely loving. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Praise belongs to God, the sustainer of the worlds. Ashadu wa la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika la. Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu, muhammadan habiballah wa rasuluhu. I bear witness before all who are present that there is no deity except Allah who is one and without partner. And I bear witness that Muhammad is the beloved of God and her messenger. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Muhammadin rasulillahi wa ahli baytihi tahirin wa sahibi tayyibin wa salam. Blessings and peace on Muhammad, the messenger of God, and his purified family, and his worthy and good companions, and peace. Ya ibadullah wa nafsi itaqallah. O worshippers of God and myself, maintain due reverence towards God. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace be with you and the enveloping mercy of God and her blessings. I begin with a prayer given to us by the Prophet Musa. Peace be upon him. For the words and thoughts that I'm about to share with you today. O my nourisher, Open for me my chest, grant me self-confidence, contentment, and boldness. Ease for me my task, and remove the impediment from my speech so that they may understand what I say. Amin. I begin by acknowledging that Allah created humanity in and of this earth, and as her Khalifa, and this land which we are on has been inhabited continuously for over 15,000 years. Um, one of the admin, please mute other members of this call. To end systematic and institutional violence, we must center the narratives of indigenous peoples in our struggles for dignity and justice. Those among us who are not native or indigenous to Turtle Island, which is um, what we call North America, especially those who are settlers or of settler descent, directly benefit from the occupation, colonization, and genocide of the indigenous peoples of this land. Settlers also directly benefit from the kidnapping and the forced labor of indigenous people from Turtle Island and other places in the world. I also acknowledge the historic injustices of slavery, forced migrations, and indentured, indentured labor past and ongoing. In solidarity against occupation, colonization, and the injustices inflicted on the First Nations, I acknowledge that this is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee peoples. It is also the land of the Petun and the huron wendats peoples, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. It is also the land of the One Dish, One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which is pictured on this slide. It was a covenant between the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe and other nations to share the resources and take care of this land. Today, Takaranto, or Toronto, is still home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are very grateful to have the opportunity to live, work, play, serve, and worship on this territory. Takaranto is also home to the red-tailed hawk, the eastern gray squirrel, the red fox, raccoons, white-tailed deer, bats, many insects, and other species. Recognizing whose land we are on is a start, but we cannot stop there. There can be no reconciliation without conciliation, and there can be no conciliation without reparations. Those here who are not First Nations must remember that we are guests on this land and we need to be better guests. I would also like to pay my respects to First Nations elders, past and present, and to any who may be with, with, here, with us here today, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Before I begin, I just want to note today's khutbah will include mention of murder, suicide, homophobia, sexual violence, and other sensitive matters. Please take care of yourself as you listen to this khutbah. The khutbah will be recorded and it will be available on the uh, El Tohi Gemma Circle Facebook group. So please feel free to take a break from listening if you need to. And if you need support, please check out the resources that we will post on the ETJC Facebook page as well. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. O oh, humankind, we created you from a single pair of a male and a female and made you into nations and tribes that you may know each other, not that you may despise each other. Verily, the most honored of you in the sight of Allah is the one who is the most righteous of you 
and Allah has full knowledge and is well acquainted with all things. As many of you know, June is Pride Month. Although this month is typically a time that we celebrate, with the recent departure of Sarah Hegazi, we are all grieving. To challenge the systems that created an impossible space for Sarah and other queer folk, I will present for you a chapter from Omid Safi's book, Progressive Muslims. This book is a collection of essays that challenge the images of Islam held by both xenophobic Westerners and extremist Muslims. I focus on the chapter by Scott Kugel. This um, reading is also available on the al Jama Circle Facebook page. If you go to the files tab here, you'll see the reading that I'm about to present here. And I also want to note there are many other resources um, and other content under the files tab that is very useful and helpful. So definitely check that out. Getting into today's discussion, um, I'm comparing outlines here to note that Google's article is much more nuanced than my simpler summary. I'm going to hit on the main points to give uh, because of time constraints. However, Google's article does a marvelous job of highlighting the importance of sexuality and spirituality, politics, the economy, and social justice. If you want more information on any of those items, definitely check out his work. Kugel opens with an excerpt from Imam Ghazali, a highly regarded and monumental scholar in Islamic history. In the name of God, the merciful and compassionate, praise be to God, the marvels of whose creation are not subject to the arrows of accident. Minds do not reflect on the beginning of such wonders except in awe and bewilderment. Praise be to God, the favor of whose grace is continued to be bestowed upon all creatures. These graces come in succession upon the created beings, whether or not they, they wish to receive them. One of God's marvelous favors is creating human beings out of water, causing them to be related by procreation and marriage, and subjecting creatures to desire through which God impelled them toward sexual intercourse and thereby preserve their descendants. Google says that Imam Ghazali, and not just the Imam, but all Islamic scholars, and even the Prophet himself, talked about sex and sexuality openly and candidly. He says, if we can judge by the traditions passed down from the Prophet, it appears that the Prophet Muhammad challenged his society not only in the realms of faith and ritual, but also in the realm of sexual pleasure and the complex relationships it creates. And this is the heart of Google's argument in this chapter. The Prophet came to challenge all social realities, private and public. Elsewhere in the chapter, Kugel highlights that the Prophet challenged assumptions about sexuality by highlighting the relationships between spirituality and sexuality. Today, especially in mass media and in mainstream Muslim spaces, we get this idea that Islam is sexually repressive. Google compares Islam to other wor world religions and states that Islam is notably sex positive. I'm not going to get into the uh, comparisons because he really exposes those other Abrahamic faith traditions and, and even other religions like, like Buddhism um, as being not as sex positive. My first reading of these comparisons made me feel very uncomfortable. I, I don't like putting other people's religions down because I know how that feels. Um, but when I reread Kugel's work, I realized maybe he was not talking to his Muslim audience in that moment. Instead, he was setting up these comparisons for people of those other faith traditions to challenge their assumptions about Islam. He states that in the Quran and in the Prophet's teachings, sexuality is not an obstacle to spirituality. In fact, Kugel says, rather, sexuality is a field where spirituality plays out. In other words, we can see our spiritual selves through our sexual selves. Even conservative religious scholars saw sex sexuality positively. The Quran does not blame sex or sexual desire for the quote-unquote fall of Adam and Eve, nor do Muslims in general see sex as part of a fleshy corruption in the life of this world. And this is especially beautiful, Kugel says, sexual desire is part of creation and expresses Allah's wisdom. It brings divided people together. It forces them to confront spiritual and ethical truths and it allows for a continuity between generations. Sexuality is not limited to these three functions, but these three functions are profound. To heal divisions, to confront truth, and to continue the human species. And then Kugel offers ample evidence from the Quran 
and from prophetic tradition to highlight Islam's sex positivity. He also notes that uh, the openness to contraception among Muslims historically, which means Muslims were comfortable with sex for pleasure and not procreation. He also quotes many Islamic scholars who emphasize the relationship between sexuality and spirituality in Islam. One of those scholars is a Tunisian sociologist, Abdul Rahab Bahdiba, who states, imposing the radical legitimacy of the practice of sexuality, that's a mouthful, Islam helped in the formation of a specific form of culture. The continuous outpouring of onerism combined with the most delicate and most elaborate eroticism gave birth to a particularly original and attractive mode of life. To be attentive to one's own body, to assume, in, to, to assume it in its totality, to take one's fantasies seriously, to make the quest for orgasm an essential aim of earthly life and even the life to come are some of the aims of Islam. So Islam helped create a, a specific culture because Muslims were committed to sexuality as a legitimate spiritual practice. This culture promoted attention to and care for our bodies, and that included serious attention and care for our sexualities, erotic fantasies and orgasms included. To conclude this first point, there is a history of sex positivity in Islam if we look at the Prophet and his tradition, the Quran and Islamic scholars. The next point is that the Quran does not mention homosexuality. Google segues into this point by taking a step back and asking thought-provoking questions aimed at Muslims and focused on the human condition. Is it honest to assume that all Muslims are straight? Can we really say that there are only two genders when gender is social and not biological? Is it realistic to pretend that sexual desire is always only between a man and a woman? The answer to all these rhetorical questions is simply no. He also implicitly asks another question. Does the Quran even mention homosexuality? No, it doesn't, it can't, because homosexuality as we know it today did not exist when the Quran was written down. In fact, the term homosexuality was invented in 1869 and was used mainly by Europeans to pathologize sexuality that was not between a man and a woman. So how are we to figure out if the Quran would approve of or disapprove of homosexuality? Google refers to the, the different ways to read the Quran, including them, thematic interpretations. Um, basically, a thematic analysis focuses on like a single theme, which can be like a concept, an image, or a character. The thematic analysis will trace the multiple appearances of this theme throughout the Quran, and it tries to provide like a, a full picture of the theme based on its multiple and various instances and mentions without privileging any one verse over another verse, and trusting that the Quran provides a thematic unity underneath all these instances. After all, God did write the book. If we think about sexual and gender diversity, we can refer to how the Quran thematically treats diversity. Kugel states that the Quran respects diversity in physical appearance, constitution, and uh, stature, the color of human beings. These are all natural consequences of divine wisdom in creation. He refers to the Quran and finds many verses that value diversity, which suggests that human nature has been created diverse with intention by God, not just in language, ethnicity, and appearance, but also in inward disposition and personality. Islamic scholars have traditionally acknowledged that Allah created two genders and also created people who do not fit within that gender binary. Google quotes an Islamic scholar, Ali Motaki. Who acknowledges, this is, who acknowledges this clearly in the introduction to his book on marriage and sexual play. In the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate. Praise be to God who created male and female as partners, then mixed the two in a, div, in a, divine, in a display of divine power by creating hermaphrodites as well. This language is outdated but it's clear that the, the occurrence of individuals like myself who do not fit within the gender binary are an example of a display of divine power. Praise be to the one who favored humanity over all the rest of creation and made the continuation of the world to rest upon the conjugal union of the male with the female. 
From this analysis, which again is much more detailed in Google's chapter, we can see that sexual and gender diversity are aligned with the Quranic respect for human diversity. Sexuality is inherent in a person's personality. Therefore, sexual diversity is a part of Allah's plan. It's a part of Allah's creation. And Allah's creation is never accidental. It's always beautiful. It's always marvelous. So now you're probably thinking, okay, if sexual diversity is Allah's plan, then what about the people of Lut? So let's turn to the earliest and actual recorded story of Lut. I note that Google takes special care in introducing this story and grounding it in religious studies. I'm going to sift through that and get to the heart of the story. Google states that since the classical period, Muslim scholars have been engaging in a thematic analysis of the Quran by telling stories of the prophets or Qisas um, al-Anbiya, the stories of the prophets. Unfortunately, we don't have access to books from the very early time period. However, we do have the stories of the prophets written by Kisai, who wrote in the 12th century and who refers to these earlier books that we no longer have access to because they don't exist. Kisai's work is one of the earliest texts that we have on the stories of the prophet. Kisai arranges the verses about Lut in a narrative style and he adds to the verses a knowledge about the historical and sociological context of the cities of the plain and the society that thrived there. Um, Google quotes him directly, and I have uh, the text on the slide, so if you want to come back to this, this uh, recording, you can read the text, or you can refer to Google's actual chapter and read the text there. I'm going to summarize, because there's a lot of background that Kasai provides. So there were five cities that made up the cities of the plain, and the, uh, like the, the capital of these cities was Sodom. The people were notorious for cheating in accounts and shooting at thrown clay targets. al Kisai states that they were well known for sins like clapping their hands, playing sports with pigeons, lining up fighting birds, playing with tooth toothpicks, chewing gum, setting up dogfights and cockfights and worshiping graven idols. Note there is no mention of same-sex relations. So the people of these cities were quite wealthy and powerful and had gardens that were lush within and outside their homes. But then a famine hit these cities and they fell into poverty. Shaitan came to them and he told them that the famine happened because they were uh, irresponsible. He told them that they should have guarded their gardens, even the public gardens where travelers would stop and take refuge. So then the people of the cities asked Shaitan for how they could protect themselves from strangers eating older food in case a famine struck again. He said, and I quote, make it your custom that if any strangers come and enter the, the orchards of your lands, you, you will rape them from behind and steal all their belongings. If you do that, nobody will dare stop in their travels to spend the night. On hearing this, the people go searching for someone that they could debauch. Uh, Iblis then appeared to them in a different form, in the form of a young man. He was handsome and richly dressed. The people overtook him. They stole all his belongings and they fucked him. And then they made a custom of doing this. Then Lut arrives in Sodom and his prophethood begins. He tries to warn the people and to bring them out of injustice to justice. And al Qasai refers to the Quran, the Quranic ayats to ground this uh, narrative as well. His people go on rejecting Lut, threatening to kick him out of, out of the cities. Gesai refers to the Quranic verse, Indeed, you come upon men and rob wayfarers and practice reprehensible things in your gatherings. Meaning, and this is important, Gesai explains that the people's reprehensible acts were shortchanging and cheating people, clapping their hands, playing sports with pigeons, wearing luxurious clothes. Note again, no mention of same-sex relations. Then the people answered Lut immediately saying, bring on the punishment from Allah if you are sincere in speaking truth. Okay, so now the king hears about what's going on and he demands to see Lut. Lut tells him, God sent me to you so you could stop doing injustice and come back to obeying Allah. The king hears this and, and he's shook. To get out of this situation, he says to Lut, I am one with my people as they answer you, so I answer you. And so Luke goes back to the people and they, they attack and abuse him. 
This goes on for 40 years of Luth trying to invite the people towards goodness and they continue to be violent towards him. They continue to ignore him and refuse to follow him despite a warning with what sounds like an earthquake, pretty serious warning. Kugel then states that the solution to the situation came from outside of the cities of the plain. Luth was closely connected to the prophet Ibrahim. They were related, they were, uh, Ibrahim was his uncle. They were related by family ties. Their prophetic missions were similar in that they both opposed idol worship and they espoused an ethic of care for the vulnerable, for the weak, and for the marginalized peoples. The angels who were sent to destroy the people of Lut first stop at the camp of Ibrahim in the form of human beings. Ibrahim welcomes them as his guests and he invites them to stay with him and eat with him. This sets up a narrative tension that explains the story in more depth. The hospitality, generosity, and care for the poor, the strangers, and travelers that was exhibited by Ibrahim and Lut contrasts brightly and sharply with the practices of the people of the cities, the cities of the plain. They do not host strangers, they chase them away. They do not feed travelers, they rob them. They do not take care of guests and the needy. They rape them to show that they have power over them. Google states that the thematic analysis of the Quran allows us to find the, deep, the deeper uh, meanings of the Quran and how these patterns of meanings relate to in individual images or verses. In this way, the thematic analysis of the Quran tries to make clear to us that the most basic yet the most important ethical principles highlighted in the Quran. At its deepest and most meaningful level, the Quran argues that human values come from belief in one God, while inhumane values come from idolatry. Belief in one God is a basis for generosity, hospitality, and an ethic of care for the needs of others. On the contrary, belief in idols, and these idols can be heterosexism, sexism, racism, homophobia, those are idols too. Belief in idols is the basis for pride, hoarding wealth, denying the rights of others, and exploiting their weaknesses in every way possible. Sexual relations are not exempt from this ethic of care. Sexual, sexual relations can express care for others or abuse for others, depending on the situation, the moral intention, and the social context in which they are practiced. Clearly, the sexual acts of the people of Sodom, which was that they were raping guests are only um, sexual in the sense that they involved sexual organs. They were not expressions of sex, they were expressions of coercion and control. The important uh, takeaway from this is the people were punished not because they were having sex with others of the same gender, but because they were using sex as a way to oppress others. And most specifically, they were doing this in a, in a way to reject the prophethood of Lut. Google draws on several other scholars who echo Kisai's point that the people of Lut were destroyed because they raped travelers and those without protection, that they robbed from their victims, that they were cruel to their prophets and other marginalized people. Kala Aluhu Ta'ala, God the Most High said, God does not make a soul responsible beyond what it can bear. The soul will gain what it has earned and it will bear what it has earned. Our sustainer, do not blame us if we have forgotten or erred and do not lay a burden on us like the burden you laid on our forebearers. Our nourisher, do not lay a burden on us greater than we can bear. So pardon us and forgive us and have mercy on us. You are our guardian, so help us against those who ungratefully turn away from the truth. I ask for forgiveness for myself for the community and for the whole world. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Muhammadin Rasulullahi wa ahli baytihi tahirin wa sahibi tayyibin wa salam. Blessings and peace on Muhammad, the messenger of God and the purified family and his worthy and good companions and peace. Okay, so if that is the story of Lut, and it's really about highway robbery and rape, why do we think it's about homosexuality? Google refers to the work of earlier scholars and evaluates what and why they argued against homosexuality.
Uh, let's come back to the ways that we can interpret the Quran. We talked a bit about thematic analysis, which allows us to interpret the Quran and gather its meaning and message. This contrasts with a verse by verse analysis that takes revelation out of its context and it freezes its meaning into one specific meaning. This is denying the Quran its richness. Um, one of uh, my teachers says that each verse of the Quran has seven meanings and seven is just arbitrary. Each verse of the Quran has infinite meanings. So to do a verse by verse analysis takes away our potential to really understand the Quran. For those who do insist on a word for word replacement method, uh, if you speak multiple languages, I invite you to take a love song from one language and translate it word for word into English. Contemporary languages fail to, cap to capture each other's meanings, and you'll see this as you translate your love song. Now add on the fact that the Quranic Arabic is over 14 centuries old, and that the words refer to different social meanings entirely. Because of this, word-for-word -word replacement is far from ideal when we want to know the meaning of the Quran. It does a disservice to the meaning of the Quran. Google states that it is word-for-word -word replacement in classical commentaries on uh, the Quran that gave rise to a rather weak assumption that divine punishment of Lut's people would in any way indicate that homosexuality is forbidden and that same-sex acts could be punished. Even though we have already recognized that word for word recognition, uh, replacement does a disservice to the meaning and the message of the Quran, let's consider what and how past scholars explain the story of Lut. Google presents the example of Tabari, whose commentary on the Quran is accepted as one of the foundational texts. He was an early scholar who latter scholars all based their work off of. I'm not gonna read this quote because it's just, I'm gonna read Google's analysis. Google says that it's clear Tabari's strategy is definition and substitution. He takes a term and defines it. Transgression equals anal sex between men. He assigns that himself. That's not assigned in the Quran. Tabari supplements definition with substitution. He substitutes his own words for the words of the Quran, astaghfirullah, in order to add weight and validity to his interpretation. It is as if Lut were saying so-and-so. This strategy allows Tabari to make a speculative assertion as if it was a definite conclusion. This reproach of declaring anal sex between men hateful was the content of Lut's prophetic message. His purpose was to make his, this act forbidden. This speculation is actually not from the Quran itself. The Quran does not say that Lut was sent as a prophet solely or even primarily or even partially to declare anal sex between men to be forbidden. The Quran does not say that Lut's entire prophetic message revolves around sexual acts. Rather, Tabari constructs this conclusion himself through his strategy of definition and substitution. Unfortunately, Tabari's interpretation is echoed in almost all later commentaries. Once these interpretations were enshrined in classical commentaries, such conclusions were reported in um, most commentaries, commentaries through to the present day today especially in commentaries that pretend to be simple translations, like that of Abdullah Yusuf Ali. Google does a fantastic job of exploring and debunking other scholars' interpretations of the Quran and explaining Islamic jurists' assumptions that, that homosexuality could or should be punished. I'm going to skip over um, all of that and come back to his thematic analysis, which really, it really helps us un understand the, the meaning and the message of the story of Luke. The thematic analysis of the stories of the prophets highlights how the Quran tells the stories with an underlying unity of intention. Their situations are different, but their ethical message is the same to each community. Through different means, each community finds a way of rejecting their prophets, and the means are often very violent. The Quranic discourse on Lut, therefore, mentions his unique circumstances, but always stresses his commonality with other prophets who preceded him and came after him, like Nuh, Ibrahim, Saleh, Hud, and others. Fragments of Lut's story are always retold in the Quran as part of a series about the seven exemplary punishments dished out to the communities of the past who rejected their prophet. Google states how we can clearly see how the jurist's treatment of the story prevents its deeper meaning 
when we compare Lut's story with that of Saleh. Allah sent Saleh to the people of Thamud as their prophet. Like the people of Lut, the people of Thamud were wealthy, powerful, and arrogant. While the issue with Lut, while the issue with the people of Lut was giving hospitality and protection to travelers, the issue with the people of Saleh was the protection of a consecrated camel. Saleh announced to his people that a certain camel was made sacred and should be allowed to wander freely. She could eat and drink on anyone's land and she had to be respected by everyone. The camel was a symbol for the weak and the vulnerable members of society. If the people could take care of the camel, they might be able to have the spiritual insight and the ethical strength to care for the needy in the midst of their society and at its margins. Clearly, there are deep thematic parallels between the story of Lut and Saleh. The people of Samud rejected Saleh as their prophet and ridiculed his teachings of care and justice. When he urged them to protect the consecrated camel, the arrogant nobles of their community hamstrung her, tied her up, and slaughtered her. As a consequence, their city with all its inhabitants was destroyed by Allah with um, a violent earthquake and a volcanic eruption. Why did they kill the camel? To repudiate their prophet, to lower his dignity in the eyes of their fellows, and to reject the belief of the one God, which was a foundation of his ethical message. Kugel states, nobody would take seriously a commentator who presents the, the people of Thamud as being obsessed by a hatred of camels or a perverted lust for camel blood that corrupted their innermost dispositions. Nobody would take seriously a jurist who argued that slaughtering another, camel, another person's camel is a capital crime. Nobody would argue that anyone who slaughters an animal that does not belong to him should be punished by asphyxiation. Anyone who suggests these interpretations would be laughed out of the mosque and would be gently reminded that he or she had missed the basic point of Saleh's story. The same is true for those who missed the point of Lut's story. The Quran tells the stories in a series. They are always grouped together. They are told in a specific context that encouraged Muhammad to have patience and perseverance in the face of rejection, rep repudiation, and oppression at the hands of the rich and powerful of the pre-Islamic Quraysh nobles of Mecca. This brings us to the final point. We need to go beyond accepting that past scholars were wrong. We need to create change. In reading the story of Lut, jurists have large, they just missed the point. The point of the story, as Kugel states, it's primarily ethical in intent, not juridical. The Quran tells the story to an audience struggling to meet the challenges of faith and realize the fullness of the prophet's teachings of Tawheed. Challenging stigma around same-sex sexuality can actually be a positive act for contemporary Muslims, one that brings new clarity to questions of sexual ethics. And addressing sexual, sexual ethics, according to Google, is a more faithful reaction to a close reading of the Quran. Kugel states that the point of Lut's story, again, it's ethical, not juridical. He states that Lut was exemplary in revealing the challenges of hospitality, generosity, and protection of the vulnerable. He struggled with his community to get them to support the needy, the poor, and those who appeared as strangers. He challenged their arrogance, their inhumane exertion of power over vulnerable people, and their creation of a coercive system out of trade and economic relations. These are certainly challenges that Muslims face in their personal lives and collective societies. We have not lived up to Lut's basic challenge yet. The way Google describes the people of Lut is alarmingly similar to how many Muslim countries and Muslim societies operate today. He offers the examples of Pakistan and Egypt to illustrate this point as well. Countries where consensual sex is forbidden, but rape and its horrors are permitted because of the gender of the parties involved. Again, in Muslim majority countries, the gender of the people involved makes consensual sex forbidden, but rape and its horrors are permitted. It is likely that Muslims are pointing to the low-hanging fruit in Lut's story instead of seeing the obvious glaring truth 
that they should be taking care of their most vulnerable. They should be providing hospitality. They should be offering support to each other, especially those at the margins of society. Google goes on to say, as part of this fundamental ethical challenge, it is clear that Lutz also confronted his society's exploitive use of sex. He condemned its use of sexual acts as a form of coercion. This is the prohibitive side of his message. The positive side would enjoin upholding consensual agreement, reciprocity, mutuality, and care in sexual acts and relationships. For Muslims to live up to Lutz's challenge would mean categorically opposing rape, whether it be men raping men or men raping women or people of any gender raping people of other genders. Luth's story clearly shows that rape is only sexual in the most crass level. Again, it only, it's only sexual in that it involves sexual organs. In reality, rape is motiva motivated by a desire for domination, not by sexual desire, nor by, nor by a desire for, for pleasure. It is a form of coercion, control, and punishment that can have no place. It can have no place in a society that respects the message of the prophets. Google states, we must be honest in acknowledging that patriarchy existed before the Quran was revealed, and it continued through the early Muslim community through to our communities to the present day. Sexism, heterosexism, transphobia, homophobia are all products of patriarchy. Although the Prophet Muhammad seriously challenged the Arab patriarchy after, right after his death, the early Muslims often fell back onto those norms in hopes of social stability and in the creation of a new Islamic elite ruling class. And we see this with immigrants too. Immigrants are often more attached to their cultural norms than folks who are still in their countries of origin. Google notes that as time changes, as our societies develop and progress, our perceptions of human nature and social change and, and social norms also change and the practice of religion changes with it. This is a reality. It is unavoidable and is, it's unescapable and alhamdulillah for that. Google notes several ideas Muslims had in the past that has changed over time. <clears throat> but this reality is not just an ethical challenge, it's a blessing. The changes in our religion over time gives us the chance of rethinking and thinking differently to free ourselves from the shackles of patriarchal power. Many Muslims today cannot imagine that Islam could be a religious practice that acknowledges and respects diversity in sexuality and sexual practices. They may not even recognize the aspects of patriarchy that oppress people characterized by same-sex desire and erotic language. This is no different from other forms of oppression that would struggle, that is with jihad and ijtihad, Muslims have managed to overcome with positive results for our understanding of our own faith. As Muslims, we have focused our sense of justice demanded by radical tawhid on the fields of political organizations, economic ownerships, gender norms. But why stop there? Why not continue to extend this challenge, this challenging focus on justice into the more intimate spaces of our sexual lives in order to think more clearly about how our erotic lives intersect with our spiritual lives? I would further Kugel's point and argue that the intimate, the most personal, is also the most political. And I think he would agree with this. At the beginning of this chapter, Kugel states that the Quran demands an acute sense of justice from all Muslims. The Quran demands an acute sense of justice from all Muslims. Justice does not allow us to displace political tensions and economic inequalities onto sexual and intimate relationships. Therefore, we cannot fight political and economic inequalities without fighting for sexual and intimate justice at the same time. Kugel opens his chapter in dedication to Hamid Nasto for bravery despite despair. I'm sorry. Nasto was a Canadian African teenager whose life ended in 2000. 
he had been bullied by really bullied by students at his high school who called him derogatory ter slur terms for queer folks. And we remember the victims of the Pulse shooting in Orlando, in Florida, where an Afghan American who had a very warped understanding of Islam wrought a devastation that night. It is with heavier hearts now that we grieve Sarah Higazi. I didn't know Sarah, but her life story has broken my heart. I draw on the Palestinian Film Festival's statement, Sarah Higazi was in her own words, super communist, super gay and a feminist. She was an Egyptian activist and writer who led several campaigns to combat discrimination against LGBTQ people in Egypt and had participated in several solidarity campaigns with prisoners of conscience. Sarah participated in several solidarity campaigns uh, with prisoners of conscience. Sarah was forced into exile in Canada after her imprisonment and torture by Egypt for raising the pride flag at Mashu Leila's 2017 concert in Cairo. For Sarah, prison left her with significant trauma. While in exile, Sarah co-ran the platform Al Suriya, spoke publicly, completed academic courses, and published. Some of her work is available at Spring Magazine. Unfortunately for us, Sarah left this world on June 14th, just five days ago. Some people are saying that she committed suicide. No, she was murdered. She was tortured and abused in Egypt, and because of that violence and dehumanization, she developed PTSD. Here in Canada, a country where homophobia, racism, and sexism are part and parcel of our social life, I can only imagine how triggering the everyday abuse that Sarah endured must have been for her. After the shooting at Pulse, Annie Zonevelt of the Muslims for Progressive Values, MPV, Annie Zonevelt told the imams that who do not address LGBTQ inclusion, that they have blood on their hands. Today, for Sarah Hegazi, I repeat those words. Imams, scholars, and community leaders, you who refuse to speak out on inclusion, you who refuse to denounce prejudice, you have blood on your hands. Governments that are eager to surveil, silence, and sentence their citizens, and yet simultaneously, you ignore the basic needs of your most marginalized, you have blood on your hands. Families that reject and refuse their child or sibling just because of who they love, you have blood on your hands. It is heartbreaking that so many lives have been lost, that so many people are forced to suffer in silence because mainstream Muslims are holding fast to an Islam that is not even based on the Quran. Inshallah, we can be brave enough to challenge ourselves and our understandings of Allah, Islam, and the Quran. I pray that we can take up Luke's basic challenge of hospitality, generosity, and protection of the vulnerable especially refugees. Tomorrow is World Refugee Day. Now is the time to take up Lut's basic challenge. May Allah guide us in being more open to her love. May we be open to the playfulness and the curiosity. May we be open to the pleasure and wonder of sexuality. May Allah protect us from those who would take the blessing of sexuality and sexual attraction in all of its forms and perverted into a system of control. May we be loved. May we be loved. Wakul Rabbi Zidni Ilman and say, my sustainer, increase me in knowledge. From Bukhari, Kala an Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet, God bless him and grant him great peace. The best of you are those with the most beautiful character. I testify and bear witness that there is no God but God, blessings and peace on all the prophets and messengers of God, 
including Adam, Hawa, Ibrahim, Hajar, Ismail, Sara, Ishaq, Musa, Asya, Dawood, Maryam, Yahya, and Isa. I testify and bear witness that there is no God but God. Muhammad is the messenger of God. Blessings and peace of God be upon him. Inna Allaha wa malaikatuhu yusalluna ala nabi. Ya ayuha ladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu tasliman. Truly God and her angels give blessings to the Prophet Muhammad. O oh, those who have believed, give your blessings to him and blessings of peace and invoke peace for him. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala ala Muhammad kama salaita ala Ibrahim wa ala ala Ibrahim. Allahumma barik ala Muhammadin uh, Allahumma barik ala Muhammadin wa ala ala Muhammad kama barakta ala Ibrahim wa ala ala Ibrahim. Fil alamina innaka hamidhu majeeb. O oh God, greet Muhammad and the family of Muhammad as you greeted Ibrahim and the family of Ibrahim. O oh God, bless Muhammad and the family of Muhammad as you blessed Ibrahim and the family of Ibrahim. Indeed, you are ever praised and ever exalted in the universe. May Allah bless us with love and the love of those who love Allah. May we be transformed into mirrors of the example of the prophets and the mirrors of Allah's radiance in our hearts and in our lives as agents of love and transformation. Subhana. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yusrifun wa salamun ala al-mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Glory be to you, sustainer, the, the possessor of renown from what they allege. Peace be to the ones who were sent. The, the praise belongs to Allah, the sustainer of the worlds. God forgive me for any errors I have made and God knows best. Akim wa let us pray. <laughs>